I can see there are a few of you logging on already. I'm just going to leave it another couple of minutes just so everyone can log on and then we'll get started. I think the numbers are probably just about stabilizing now. So there's two of us that will be speaking to you today. So there's myself and Oliver Riley. Oliver is a barrister in the family team, and he has a practice that consists of private children work, salata and matrimonial finance. What he's going to do is he's going to chat to you about this idea of the deemed divorce test that forms part of the section three criteria when one's looking at a claim by a spouse under the 1975 act and he's also um, going to talk you through some recent cases as well what i'm going to do is i will take you through a general case update on 1975 act claims so for those of you who are logging on who are purely matrimonial finance practitioners you could feel free to just ignore the next 20 minutes or so because that's just going to be me speaking about 1975 act claims uh, for the rest of you, those of you do, that do uh, wills and probate work, all of this will be relevant. So if we get started, uh, one thing that I should say actually just before we get started is that there will be a survey or feedback form that pops up automatically at the end. Uh, if you could just remember to complete that, that would be really helpful. So starting with the case updates. First case that I want to talk to you about is a case called RE-R. And it's a particularly interesting case just because of the fact that claims by minor children seem to be relatively rare. I mean, personally, I tend to find that the vast majority of what I'm dealing with um, are claims by adult children and then also some spousal claims. Minor children claims, as I say, are incredibly rare, and so there are very few reported. But in re R, what we had was a situation where there were two children, J and H, aged 16 and 15 at the date of their father's death in 2018. And so they claimed reasonable financial provision. Now the parents, their parents had divorced in 2012 and the mother had remarried shortly afterwards with the claimants then relocating with mother and her new partner to Scotland. Now, their father was diagnosed with incurable lung disease in 2004, and he had weekly contact with them for only a short period of time. He paid no maintenance or child support. And the mother and her new husband, in fact, bore the cost of continuing the children's private education. Now, the deceased father had left in his will everything to his parents and his partner of seven years. The net value of the estate on this case is a minimum of 519,000. And I say a minimum because the total was going to be subject to share valuations that were unknown at the time. The deceased had recorded that he did not wish the claimants to benefit because he had been unable to make contact with them for more than three years. He had also recorded that his stepdaughter was going to be an adult in September of 2018 and by agreement he no longer would provide for her. By the date of the hearing, Jay was 18 and in the Scottish University and H was 17 and was a sixth form boarder hoping to study at a university in England. And the court noted that there was a distinction between section 11C and section 11D. So said with the latter, what the court needs to do is consider factors such as whether the deceased maintained the child for how long, on what basis and whether there was an assumption of responsibility. Whereas under section 11C, the obligations that a parent owes their child make this inappropriate. The court said you can't simply rely um, generally on a failure to pay child support or maintenance um, to defeat the claim. The lack of contact and assumption of responsibility by another were in fact factors that are capable of impacting the value of the claim, but only in the most exceptional circumstances would the court actually accepts that the obligation to maintain has been completely severed. 
they said generally a clean break is not going to be applicable in respect of child maintenance. Now the mother had been the only parent who was in fact maintaining the claimants since 2012. And so the court said, well, she cannot reasonably expect that the entire obligation is then going to shift to the deceased estate. The court also has to guard against unreasonable claims made by a surviving parent on a child's behalf, particularly where there is proper concern that the claim is being viewed as an attempt to simply rewrite the will. The school fees have been a heavy burden on the mother and that needed to be reflected in any award. The court noted that it wasn't limited to ordering payments for future living expenses and it could in fact backdate the award to the date of death, but that, that wouldn't be appropriate in this case. Now, ultimately, it ordered that the deceased estate should pay 50% of the claimant's living expenses at home from the date of issue until the age of 21. It also ordered that the costs of Jay's final year at university should be paid, and H's past fees as a pupil in fifth form should be covered, plus 80% of his two-year future boarding fees in sixth form. The remaining 20% and any extra school costs the court felt was appropriate for that to be paid by the mother. 50% of the cost of providing each child with reliable second-hand cars was to be paid. But the court said there's no reasonable maintenance need for any university costs. Tuition fees themselves are not payable in Scotland. And so if H decided that he wanted to attend a university in England, it was reasonable to expect him to obtain a student loan to do so. Provision was, however, made for 50% of post-university housing costs, so for one year, and one year of private counselling. Now, ultimately, because of the differences in so far as the boarding fees were concerned, this meant that one of the children ended up uh, with £68,022 and the other £117,962. But you'll see from that that the way the court analyses it and considers it is very different to when one's dealing with an adult child. If we move on to the next case, which is Miles and Shearer. In that case, the claimants so were dealing with adult claimants, their adult children. And in that case, they were 40 and 39 years old. And the, defend, the deceased had been married to their mother for 34 years until divorce in 2007, when matrimonial assets were in fact split 50-50. He then remarried in 2015 and made a will under which his second wife, P, was the principal beneficiary. And no provision was made for either of the claimants. If P had predeceased the deceased, uh, some provision was made for the first claimant and for her two daughters. And P made a mirror will. Now, the deceased died in 2017, leaving an estate that was worth circa £2.2 .2 million. And the claimant's parents had funded their private education gap years of university courses. In fact, in 2008, the deceased had gifted 177,000 to the first claimant and 185,000 to the second claimant, resulting from the sale of a property in London. And the deceased at that time wrote a letter to the claimants indicating that they should invest that money in property and that they should expect no further financial assistance from him. There was further correspondence as well, which supported his expectation that they would be financially independent following those gifts. Now, unsurprisingly, the claim in this case failed and the court noted that the claimants were adult children who lived their own lives and made their own lifestyle decisions without further financial assistance after 2008. Neither claimant could demonstrate needs for maintenance, which they could not meet, if, if necessary, by an adjustment to their lifestyle. Now, both of them had received financial assistance from their mother over the years following the divorce, particularly the first claimant whose daughter's school fees had been paid. The mother had indicated an intention to continue helping both daughters financially. The court said there's no other reported Inheritance Act case which has a surviving parent whose financial position was derived from the division of assets on divorce from the deceased. So even if the claimants had demonstrated a need for maintenance, it would be outweighed by sections 3, 1D and G. So in relation to section 3, 1D, the court said, well, a parent is not legally obliged to maintain an adult child. What it's concerned with under that particular subsection are the obligations and responsibilities immediately prior to death, not in the past. 
and in this case, there were none. Um, the deceased, defense, deceased disclaimer of the responsibility was a relevant factor. Then under section 31G, so this is the conduct and other issues, the deceased knew his own mind and acted of his own free will. And after 2008, the gifts that he'd given in 2008, he wasn't prepared to provide further financial assistance to the claimants. Their lifestyle choices were not dependent on any expectation of any such assistance. And so their claims had to fail. Now, the next case that I want to run through is a case called Shapton and Sevier. In this case, the deceased died in August 2016, leaving a widow who he'd married in March of 1999. That was his second marriage. He had two children in his first marriage, which was the claimant and another. And the defendant wife had two children in her previous marriage. Now, the last will had been executed on the 6th of December 2013. And the defendant took the entire estate outright, but if she predeceased, it would be split equally between his children and the stepchildren. The deceased and his wife were both working when they met. They weren't particularly high earners. He had in fact moved into her house, which was conveyed into joint names for them to hold as tenants in common in equal shares. Now they won 450,000 pounds as part of a work lottery syndicate and they used that to pay off the mortgage and extend the property. They also invested £100,000 into a prudential bond. And they had various holidays and paid for the education of one of each of their children. In 2014, the defendants, uh, so the deceased, had a seizure and was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour. There was also an issue of hip degeneration. He was unable to work and had a short period in the hospice before he returned home. Uh, not long before his death. Now, the estate was in fact worth 268,000, which is comprised of 215,000 being his share of the house and 51,000 insurance. Now, at the date of death, the wife still worked three days a week with no pension until 67. During the deceased illness, however, the wife exhibited signs of ill health. And, and in November 2017, she was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, and that progressed to the point that her attendance at the hearing was in fact dispensed with. Now, the wife had fought to remain independent with a care package from the local authority, and that involved making numerous adaptations to the property at a cost of £25,000 to her, and just under £24,000 was contributed by the council that they had secured by way of a charge. She received £1,377.55 per month, she had £14,512 in savings, and there was a prudential bond cash in value of £42,540, which also had a non-guaranteed final bonus of just under £20,000, but she wanted to avoid cashing that in. She was wheelchair bound, dependent on her daughter and carers for her personal hygiene and day-to-day -day care, and would eventually have to be fed through a tube. Her prognosis was uncertain. She wasn't experiencing breathing difficulties, so it was suggested that she was potentially looking at 18 months or so. She had a live-in carer on a three-week cycle, and she wanted to consider buying or leasing a wheelchair accessible vehicle, which could accommodate her electric wheelchair, and that would come at a significant cost. The claimant, by contrast, was 32 years old, married, working in the hospitality industry. She had her first child in November 2017 and the second in August 2019. Her husband had been made redundant and suffered an £11,000 pay drop, but then in fact found a new job um, at an increase in salary of £9,500 on the first um, salary that he'd had. He also received bonuses. Now the husband's work provided a vehicle and one bedroom at their home was used as an office. They also had another vehicle that was run by the two of them. The claimant suffered a loss of pay during maternity leave. She received child benefit and she was considering essentially whether it was worth her while to return to work. She said she needed a larger home instead of the three bed semi and she estimated spending in the region of £350,000 to acquire that. Now the court described this application or this claim as absolutely hopeless. It said this was a small estate, 80% of which was tied up in the wife's house where she had resided for many years and wished to stay as long as possible. The house had been adapted for her needs. 
she had a small amount of cash, um, or there's a small amount of cash in the estate, sorry, but it was needed by the wife for her day-to-day -day needs. She herself had a very small income. And the daughter, by contrast, lived in a 240,000 pound house with no savings or other assets. She had 20,000 pounds of credit card debts and paid 450 pounds per month in loan, credit card and bank charges. There had been a disingenuous statement by the daughter about an inability to afford holidays when in fact she had had several luxury holidays with her husband's parents and they had use of a speedboat. The grandmother had assisted with a deposit on their house. They had a high combined income, more than adequate to meet their day-to-day -day needs. The court said it became apparent during the case that in fact the claimant was motivated by the view that she was entitled as of right to one quarter of her father's estate and that she is clearly not. The wife took all under the will, she changed her own will and that was her prerogative. Essentially this is quite a clear cut case where the claimant's claim was bound to fail. Surprising to some extent that this progressed to a trial to be honest in the circumstances. Now the next case we want to have a look at is Reh. So this is a case that I imagine a lot of you will have heard about because of the CFA implications. So in this case, the claimant's father died in 2016. The estate was valued at 554,000. The claimant's mother was a sole beneficiary, resided in a care home, when she was nearly 80, but she had extensive health problems and was worried about her ability to fund her care. The claimant was 50 and suffered from a severe and debilitating mental illness. Now, as a result, she was unable to support herself and her two children. She relied, in fact, quite heavily on state benefits and precarious financial support from her partner. She, it was said, needed to continue psychotherapy for up to three years, and then it looked like she may be able to return to work. Her only sibling was another defendant who was financially independent. And the claimant sought reasonable financial provision to purchase a home, sums to pay for therapy, replacement car, and new white goods. She also sought an income fund to meet the shortfall in her living expenses and a sum to discharge her legal fees. Now, her solicitors were on a CFA, and so she was liable for a success fee of £48,175. The court decided that reasonable financial provision was not made by the will. She was awarded £138,918. And that consisted of 17,000 for her ongoing therapy, uh, just over 48,000 for the income shortfall, 32,000 because of the fact that any award meant her universal credit payments would end, 15,000 to replace the white goods and upgrade the car, and 10,000 to secure accommodation with a more sympathetic landlord. With there also being a 16,750 pounds markup under the conditional fee. The court said it'd be wrong in principle to award her an additional sum for the cost of a new property. The priority was ensuring that the mother was able to meet her care home costs for the rest of her life, and that security was at risk. The claimant's parents had had no financial responsibility for her for years, and she had in fact estranged herself from them. Her priority was to get well again. So while she herself had put her housing need as her priority, her other needs were in fact more important, i.e. recovering her health and being financially supported for that three year period to get her back into work. The interesting thing about this case is essentially the court took into account the success fee uh, and increased the award on that basis. And certainly for those of you that have dealt with any mediation since then, this has likely cropped up if you've had any where the other side or your side um, have been on a CFA. And it's very much felt that the reason for that being factored in may well be due to this being a decision um, in the family court rather than a decision in the Chancery Division we wait and see whether, in fact, there will be a subsequent case that departs significantly from this. Um, one of the things I would flag is that it's always worthwhile considering um, whether there is going to be an advantage to you by issuing in the family division rather than the chancery division. I don't know that enough people always consider that when they're issuing, so it's certainly worth doing. Um, I'd say you tend to have a stricter application of the legal principles in the chancery division. The next case is a case called B and C and others. And this is a case where the deceased was survived by his sister, as, as well as a woman that he'd had a relationship with, her two daughters, 
another woman that he'd had a relationship with and her son, who also happened to be his son. Now, his sister was an executor and he and his sister had owned 50% of the shares in the company. On his death, the sister remained a director and was in control. During his lifetime, a property had been acquired in his name and remained so at his death. Now, in fact, there were three claims made in this case. Firstly, uh, that one of the women claimed to be the beneficial owner of a particular property. She also sought an order for reasonable financial provision under section 11A. And then the other woman that he'd had a relationship with most recently also sought an order for reasonable financial provision under section 11E. So we're still talking about the maintenance standard rather than anything else. I'm not going to run through this case in substantive detail. Um, I'm flagging it mainly because it's quite an involved set of proceedings with a slight uh, strangeness in that the level of detail the court had as, as to the size of the estates uh, was lacking. It could be said that the estate was worth several million. No one could quite place an exact figure on it. And if you have a look at the judgment in that, you'll see that the court, the court wasn't particularly happy about being put in that position. It's perhaps surprising that when one's talking about an estate worth several million, that things like valuations of properties simply weren't dealt with properly. However, if you find yourself in a situation where there is a company involved and you have this debate of what to do with the company, whether it's best to break the company apart in order to satisfy the needs that exist, or whether it's best to keep the company as a going concern, this is a particularly useful case to look at. And that's the main reason that I'm flagging this up. Now, if we go on to the next slide, Vice and Vice and others is a case about interim provision. And again, this is one of those things that not everyone tends to make use of. So the deceased had married the claimant in 2005. They both had adult children from previous marriages. The family were all on good terms prior to the death. The estate was worth at least four million. The defendants were the deceased sister and his children. The wife claimed lack of reasonable financial provision and said that if she was given a budget of 102,000, that would allow her to continue living in the same manner she had with the deceased. So she applied for interim provision of 8,511 pounds per month in living costs. She also requested 20,000 pounds to repay a loan made to her by a third party and 55,578 pounds for her legal fees up to and including the hearing. The defendants argued that the court restricted, uh, was restricted to providing for her immediate needs and that 4,000 a month would be appropriate. They said there was no immediate need to repay the debts of the third party and there was no suggestion that the claimant's solicitor would refuse to act if not put in funds and no evidence that the claimant couldn't find a firm to act on the CFA. The court looked at this and said, well, it's discretion to make periodic payment and lump sum orders. Um, isn't quite the same as the discretion that the court has under section 22 of the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973. The court does have to identify an immediate need, whereas the Matrimonial Causes Act allows provision beyond immediate needs. The court said the proposed annual budget included items or categories of items that were not an immediate need. It made reductions to sums claimed for housing, housekeeping, clothing, personal expenses and holidays. It allowed the full sum claim for car expenses and charitable giving, and so there ended up being an annual budget permitted of £61,411, so £5,200 per month, pending the hearing, and it would continue until two months after conclusion of the claim or earlier settlement if achieved. In respect to the £20,000 debts, the court said this did not require immediate repayment. There was no evidence that the third party was about to issue a claim for repayment or that he couldn't live without the money. It was something that was going to be taken into account at the final hearing. Now, as regards the legal fees, the court said it's entirely unreasonable to expect a solicitor's firm to act as a creditor when there is £4 million in the estate. The claimant had found a firm that she was happy with and their fees were in fact less than half of those of the defendant's solicitors. She was under no obligation whatsoever to spend time and potentially money searching for a firm to take the case on a CFA. Now, another interesting case is Thakar and Busate. And so in that case, the estates hadn't been administered uh, and property had remained in the deceased name. So this is a case dealing with application for permission to commence proceedings out of time. Now, the widow, who is a third wife, 
occupied the property with her son and they had been the sole occupant since 1990. The property had been marketed then, and there'd been an offer of £135,000 and she was content to sell. Uh, but the children of the first wife delayed on the basis that they thought the market was depressed. If the sale had proceeded, the widow would have received 114,000 and the six children of the first wife would have received roughly 7,000 each. Now in 2019, this being a London property, it was valued at 825,000 pounds. Now the widow had no proprietary interest in the property or rights to the estate apart from this potential 1975 Act claim. The court said, well, when one's looking at the issue of the six month time limit, that is not an equivalent of a limitation period. So the CPR and the overriding objective are completely irrelevant. The test for an arguable case is essentially the same as a summary judgment. So whether it has a real prospect of success. And the court confirmed that a claim which might not have been viable within the time limit could become viable as a result of a subsequent change of circumstances. And the widow's failure to jointly administer the estate was not persuasive as to the idea that she shouldn't benefit. Uh, the widow was in a situation where she would be left homeless and close to destitute if this claim wasn't permitted. Now, there was an unprecedented level of delay. We were talking about an application um, 25 years and nine months after expiry of the six month limit. But this was a case where the widow had limited education and her English language skills uh, were also very limited so that she was effectively powerless following the deceased death. She was in a situation where without the cooperation of the children, she couldn't sell the property and the administration had been left in limbo. The delay was not something which had prejudiced the children because there had been no distribution and that a trigger event was not in fact a precondition for permission where there had been delay, it's only a consideration. So the lack of administration was not really wrongdoing by the widow, in fact her degree of culpability was very low. Now there's another case that it's quite interesting, which is Wickham and Riley. And in that particular case, permission was requested to withdraw discontinuance of a 1975 Act claim on a father's estate or to issue a further claim. And what happened is notices of discontinuance had been sent to the defendants and the court by the claimant and his sister in respect to the 1975 Act claim. The claimant subsequently was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and an issue arose over his capacity without a litigation friend. He gave evidence that he had essentially agreed to settle as his mother had told him the claim would cost her money in fees, but he had since changed his mind. The third and fourth defendants submitted that the claim had been validly discontinued. The failure to file a notice confirming the litigation friend had ceased to act should lead to his claim being struck out and neither he nor his sister should be given permission to issue a further claim under CPR 38.7 because of the six month time limit. Now, the court found the claimant had capacity in March 2019 to serve the notice of discontinuance, so the proceedings did in fact end in March 2019. But nonetheless, the balance weighed in favour of granting permission to issue proceedings despite the expiry of limitation. The justice of allowing a claim against the estate to proceed outweighed prejudice or injustice of the defendants in allowing a claim to proceed out of time. But it said that the balance is in fact much finer when what you're talking about is allowing a second set of proceedings to be issued. The claimant's vulnerability and the reasons for serving the notice against a backdrop of a substantial settlement or potential claim, and the extent to which he was influenced by one of the defendants, namely his mother, were significant factors. This wasn't a decision by a commercial entity after careful consideration. In fact, it was the decision of a vulnerable 18-year-old under the influence of, and on the advice of, his mother, who was his primary carer, and so permission was granted. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, the details of the other cases. I've just flagged them briefly on the slide to note that in Barkatali, uh, that's a bit of a curious case in that it's an attempt by someone to use a 1975 Act claim to obtain an interim injunction to try and ensure that they can stay at a property. And then why in another and C in others concerns a situation where the executives failed to adopt a neutral stance in a 1975 Act uh, claim and had in fact been conflicted throughout, such that they were ordered to pay the beneficiary's costs. They were not entitled to the indemnity from the estate in respect of those costs or their own costs. So if you are ever acting for executors, just remind them to remain neutral. Equally flag up to them any issues such as conflict. Now, 
there may be some questions, but I'll deal with those at the end. What I'll do now is I will hand over to Oliver. Uh, hello, good afternoon, both. Just a moment, I'm going to uh, share my screen, hopefully. Hopefully you are able to see that. And, and yeah, so I am um, a, a family practitioner um, in the main, um, but of course, as Natasha said at the outset, there is a, a degree of overlap um, when inheritance tax claims are brought by uh, spouses or civil partners of the deceased. And the, the, the overlap is, is particularly relevant, I suppose, when looking at um, the quantification of a financial remedy claim. So what I'm going to do is, is just go through um, some of the general principles that are applicable to, to valuing a, a financial remedies claim before looking at some um, brief case law updates, time permitting. And so just very briefly to, to look at why there is this, this need um, to consider the, um, the approach which might be taken in a, a financial remedies claim. Um, and that's because of course that there are sort of two levels of, of award um, which can be appropriate in a, an inheritance tax claim. Um, and in respect of claims by spouses or civil partners, um, the, the award is based um, on all the circumstances of the case for a husband, wife or civil partner to receive. Um, so in the context of their sort of status as a husband, wife or civil partner, um, and equally um, unlike for other classes of person, um, it is not uh, necessary that, that any award be required for his or her maintenance. And so the, the way the sort of the, the context of the, their status as a, as a husband, wife or civil partner is explored, um, is, is effectively by looking at what they may well have been awarded by way of ancillary relief. And, and this is um, what's sort of referred to as, as the, the deemed divorce test. Now, um, unfortunately, particularly for financial remedies lawyers, um, like myself, it's not simply a case of just applying those principles to a spouse applicant's claim in order to um, quantify it. it. It's but one of, of, of numerous factors which are courts required to consider in um, a claim brought under the Inheritance Act. And uh, I suppose as a sort of word of, of caution from the outset, that the, the assessment which may well take place within a financial remedies application um, can differ um, significantly to the outcome of an inheritance tax claim. Uh, and I suppose the particular standout um, areas where that seems most likely to be the case are, are cases where the, the assets are extremely limited. Um, in cases where there are a number of, of competing claims in respect of um, inheritance act applications. But notwithstanding this, um, it is um, an important exercise which does need to be undertaken. And yeah, the case referred to in the slide, Mars and Mars, is an example of where a failure to address the potential financial remedies outcome within the context of an inheritance act application was um, of itself a, a successful ground of appeal. And what the, the, the I suppose, the obligation to consider is, is it's been referred to as, as a statutory cross-check. Um, so in effect, um, something which is considered against um, what the Inheritance Act application outcome would otherwise be um, to ensure that, well, whether it's to ensure there's a degree of parity or not, it's really to be alive to um, what the outcome may well have been within the financial remedies proceedings, and if there is to be a difference um, to sort of understand um, why. But what's not required is a sort of a meticulous analysis of uh, what would effectively be a quasi financial remedies claim within the inheritance tax claim. Um, all the court needs to be able to do is reach a, a sufficient conclusion uh, as to how the financial proceedings, uh, financial remedies proceedings, forgive me, um, would have resolved and um, the extent to which that requires um, detailed analysis is, is, of course, a really a question of fact and degree for um, individual cases. And so Really, um, what, what I'm going to do is, is just have a, a quick um, talk about um, some, some general principles applicable to value and financial remedies claims. Um, and these are only some, some brief sort of general observations. And I apologize from the outset to the um, family lawyers um, attending because I'm certainly not looking to sort of reinvent the wheel here, but, but really hopefully just look at some of the general principles which are applicable to 
um, the majority of the financial remedies claims. And one thing to point out from the outset is, is as, as you might expect, there's no difference in approach um, when dealing with spouses or civil partners, the, um, the relevant provisions of the statutory um, arrangements for, 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 for both are, are, are the same in all material respects. And so the way to, I suppose, um, look to value a financial remedies claim um, is to first start by identifying um, what's in the part to what's available um, for distribution, which can um, ordinarily be categorised um, as income, capital and pensions. And so in relation to income, the, I suppose the first point to make is, is that there's no right to share in, in, in future income. And so any claim in respect of um, income moving forwards has to be needs generated. Um, it is, of course, an important factor to consider as well, um, because it affects, uh, for example, borrowing capacity, um, which can impact upon the capital need that, 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 that an applicant may have. Um, but when looking at the income specifically, effectively what you're looking at is what are the applicant's reasonable income needs both now and in the future, um, and what is their level of income, what is their earnings capacity. Um, if there is a, a shortfall between the two, um, then you may well be able to assert a claim for, for, for income needs which need to be met. Um, in a conventional financial remedies application, you're of course dealing with two um, live parties, and so that will be assessed against the respondent's income um, and the respondent's income needs. Um, and the court's going to be mindful of, of identifying, is there a, a short, uh, forgive me, is there a surplus there um, from which to meet those needs? Whether that exercise in terms of um, a, a attributing a notional income um, and income needs to, to a deceased in the context of Inheritance Act assessment is, is certainly not clear. Earlier assessment, uh, forgive me, earlier authority suggested that, that that may well have been factored in, but certainly more recent cases um, don't appear to do so. Um, limiting factor is, is more likely, um, I'd suggest, to be the, the, the size of the estate and, and the means to, um, to meet the, the applicant's um, needs, which, which will be at the, the centre of, of any assessment. But um, one point to make in relation to income is that um, there's an expectation that the receiving party will adjust to financial independence without undue hardship. Um, and certainly in the overwhelming majority of cases that there is a, a real tendency towards um, an expectation that this will happen um, sooner rather than later. So if looking, you know, if, if quantifying a, a claim in this way, then not only are you going to be looking at what, what the, the, the income needs are but, but for how long will those needs persist um, and it, it um, probably does to, to be realistic about that because as I say certainly whilst high value cases are perhaps treated slightly differently because of the um, the relevance of the standard of living the parties have enjoyed um, in the overwhelming majority of cases um, the even cases where, where, where the marriage has been I'm certainly quite long um, my experience is that the any term for periodical payments of, 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 of maintenance um, tends to be quite uh, quite significantly limited. Um, again, with, with capital and pensions, um, particularly for the purposes of, of valuing a claim in, in the context of an Inheritance Act um, claim, um, really you're looking at what, what, what assets are there um, and what's their value, but, but really of, of, of significance. I think is, is to look to identify whether they are matrimonial or not um, and have they become matrimonial in character. Um, typically um, assets acquired prior to marriage or assets which have been inherited or gifted to one party um, may um, be, be, be characterised as, as non-matrimonial and if they are um, then, then they can be treated differently which I'll, I'll come on to in, in sort of short order but um, one of the, I suppose, that the real points about um, non-matrimonial property um, is that their character can change and whether um, they have been mingled or mixed with matrimonial assets um, is often a, a strong indicator to say that the contributor is treated as accepting them as, as, as effectively becoming matrimonial. Um, and Certainly, in, in, in general terms, the significance of the source of non-matrimonial assets will almost inevitably um, diminish over time. An example where that um, didn't um, take place was, was K&L, which was an unusual case in which the uh, wife 
um, had an interest in some 57 million pounds worth of shares in a business, um, but the parties lived extremely modestly. Um, neither of them working, both living on the, the, the dividend income which was produced. And um, despite that being a, a long marriage of some 21 years in, in those circumstances, the, the court's view was that the, the significance of the source um, of non matrimonial assets didn't diminish. Um, they were kept entirely separate. Um, and, and that needed to be reflected in the uh, the ultimate settlement, um, recognising that, that whilst, as I've sort of gone to, the, these assets are still remain available to meet needs, they weren't um, matrimonial assets, um, which uh, an argument in respect of sharing might be advanced. And this just really just summarises um, what I've already sort of said in terms of non-matrimonial assets it's always going to be a matter of sort of fact and degree but but in general terms that the, the, the longer um in time ago that the, the asset was acquired um that the less likely it is that it will be characterized as um as non-matrimonial um and so where assets are brought in particularly in a short marriage case um it is less likely they'll be viewed as matrimonial and therefore um, less likely that, that they will be um, interfered with unless the, the parties um, need to acquire it. So that sort of comes to how, how once you've identified the pot, how, how do you go about distributing the assets? And um, we've already touched upon the sort of principles of, of, of sort of sharing and needs, and, and, and these are ordinarily the, the way in which assets are are sort of divided. I refer to compensation briefly because it is a recognised uh, means of distributing assets, but it is certainly an exceptional, um, uh, an exceptional way of, of looking to distribute assets, which effectively says um, that the one party should be compensated um, over and above an application of sharing for um, relationship generated disadvantage. Um, it, it's, it is um, ordinarily certainly very high net worth cases because there has to be um, sufficient um, available once sharing has taken place and an additional um, compensatory factor um, has been accounted for um, where the party's needs can still continue to be met but what the court really requires in those circumstances is quite clear evidence um, of um, a, a, a conscious decision to um, negatively impact the earnings capacity um, of one party in a really quite sort of significant way, clear evidence of, of high levels of remuneration being expected um, and anticipated, but for the decisions which the parties took during the course of the marriage. But as I say, ordinarily what you're looking at is, is sort of sharing um, and needs. And, and what I say by that is, is I suppose in, in general terms, you're looking at what are the matrimonial assets, um, if they're shared equally, um, can both parties need to be met? Um, if so, then, then invariably that's not going to be too far from the wrong outcome. Um, if not, then what is required in order to meet the party's needs, either an unequal distribution of, of those matrimonial assets, or um, this is where non-matrimonial assets will continue to come into play. Um, whilst if properly categorized as non-matrimonial, they won't ordinarily um, be subject to sharing, um, they are very readily um, able to be um, utilised for the purposes of, of meeting the party's needs. Um, and, and strictly speaking, um, non-matrimonial assets aren't um, not subject to sharing um, as a matter of fact. Um, it's rather that um, the, the fact that they are non-matrimonial is very often a very good reason to depart from the um, obligation to share. And, and, and in reality, um, certainly in the overwhelming majority of cases, um, they are not shared unless, unless needs, um, needs demand it. And so when looking at, there are of course a number of, um, of, of relevant considerations when, when looking to, to value a, a financial remedies claim and, and certainly when just sort of whizzing through things as, as, as I'm hoping to do here, it's not possible to consider all of them. Um, you know, as, as you'll be aware that the, the, the sort of the, the starting point for, for assessing these claims is, is a consideration of sort of all the circumstances and um, in particular, obviously the factors which are set out in section 25 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, but a couple of particular um, matters of, 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 of real relevance in the overwhelming majority of cases, um, I just wanted to, to talk about very briefly. First of those is um, the, the presence of, of minor children. Um, these are always hugely significant considerations in the context of financial remedies applications because um, they are 
um, put on a statutory footing as being the court's first consideration in financial remedies claim. The particular relevancy, it seems to me, of that within the context of an Inheritance Act application is the applicant is, is invariably, it seems likely to be the, the sole carer um, for any dependent children. Um, and as a consequence, that's going to feed into um, the, the, the needs of the, um, the surviving spouse. The needs of the children need to be met. And, and certainly in the ordinary course of a financial um, remedies application, um, the particular um, things which are gonna be considered is, is the housing needs of the children um, and, and what income needs do they have, and of course, those needs um, feed into the needs which the surviving spouse can, can assert. Um, and the, the other significance of, of dependent children is that the, the, the care for dependent children um, may well impact upon the earnings capacity of, of the surviving um, space and so um, a more limited earnings capacity um, more limited um, results into capacity to borrow which means in order to meet housing needs you of course require a, a larger um, capital provision um, and likewise when talking about the potential for um, a transition towards um, independence uh, in respect of um, income needs the care which a surviving party um, provides for dependent children um, can, can very obviously impact upon how long it will take to transition towards um, financial independence. And so, um, you know, for example, you know, the, the, the time frame by which a party might be expected to transition towards financial independence could well tie in with um, a, 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 reaching a particular milestone in terms of education, um, moving to secondary school, completing education, um, because of course of the impact it has on a party's ability to um, either increase their employment to full time or, or take up additional opportunities. Um, but it, it, it remains a, a very relevant factor um, and, and certainly something which from the perspective of the, the financial remedies application, um, will be um, sort of front and centre when, when assessing what the, um, the needs of the, um, the, the applicant party are. The, the other feature which I wanted to talk about um, just briefly in, in relation to um, assessing a, a financial remedies claim is the, the length of, of the marriage. And um, in particular, this is, of course, something which um, Inheritance Act practitioners are required to consider um, in Inheritance Act claims by virtue of, of, of Section 3. And, and, and I suppose it, the, the thing to say is, of course, it is relevant. Um, but but um, this fairly quite long-winded paragraph from um, Cunliffe and Fielden um, quite helpfully sort of makes clear that, that there is an obvious distinction between a, a short marriage um, where it is um, ended by virtue of one of the parties um, dying and and a short marriage which is terminated um, by the parties um, jointly uh, by virtue of their their, their decision to separate um, because of course a a, a surviving um, spouse or civil partner will say well look you know I, I was I was committed to this process for for, for for the rest of my life it has an infinite duration and it's only been brought to an end um, for, for for circumstances outside of, of either of our control which is a, a perfectly fair um, criticism to, to, to level at, at um, undue influence being given to, to the length of the marriage but 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 nevertheless um, it is likely to be viewed as a a fairly powerful argument against the equality of provision particularly if if the marriage is extremely short um, and when I say against the equality of division that that of course remains distinct from um, an assessment on the basis of needs and so really I think the significance of a, of a truly short marriage is that it limits um, which of the assets can properly be categorized as matrimonial um, in the case of Cunliffe which was a, a marriage of some 12 months um, where the parties didn't know each other um, for any significant period of time before that um, and so is, is, is short by, by any assessment um, the, the overwhelming majority of the assets were assets contributed um, by the, the deceased um, and the surviving spouse was of, was of limited means. And so really there was very little which could properly be, be categorised as, as matrimonial um, because, it, you know, there was nothing which could be called um, 
the, the joint endeavour um, of, well, forgive me, um, either the sole or joint endeavour um, of the parties, but which was created in the, in the course of the marriage itself. Um, however, there were significant assets available and those assets um, can still um, be utilised in order um, for the applicant's needs to be met. And so whilst I suppose the, the, the principle of sharing um, falls away um, to, to a certain extent, um, the court is, is still very likely to, to consider needs uh, and those needs will um, invariably be, be fairly generously assessed. Um, and in, in the case of, of, of Ms. Cun Cunliffe, um, uh, using the same language as was in a previous decision of Miller, um, the court considered it was a, a reasonable expectation that, that her life as once again a single woman need not revert to what it was before her marriage and that she could look forward to financial security for the rest of her life. And so whilst we are um, approaching it on the basis of what her needs are, her need for housing, her need for income moving forwards, um, it doesn't mean that, that, that the award will um, well, as a consequence, um, be insignificant, um, but of course it depends on, on what's available for, for distribution. The other point to make in relation to um, the, the duration of, of a marriage is that um, in financial remedies applications, where there is, as is increasingly um, common, um, a, a transition from a period of cohabitation um, seamlessly into marriage where the, the relationship itself continues in, in much the same way. Um, that longer period, which includes the premarital cohabitation, is um, the, the relevant duration um, for the purposes of assessing the length of, of the marriage in a financial remedies application. Uh, and so, you know, you get cases where, where marriages are extremely short, some one, two years, but if there's been 10, 10 years worth of, of, of cohabitation um, leading into that, um, th then it is, is, is treated in a way which is equivalent to a, a sort of a 12 year marriage. Um, it is however right to say just on, on this um, duration of, of marriage point that um, whilst 50-50 in terms of marital assets, the sort of sharing principle is, is the overwhelmingly common outcome in relation to, to sort of matrimonial assets. Um, Sharp and Sharp makes clear that, that an automatic 50-50 is an impermissible gloss on statute in circumstances where the court's required to consider all the circumstances, um, with all the circumstances, including the, the length of the marriage. Um, that was actually a, a six-year marriage, which as a standalone factor is, is, is perhaps at the, the longer end of short, um, but it was quite unique in that it was um, also a, a childless marriage where both um, parties um, had dual careers and, and kept their finances largely separate. They were both in their 40s at the time of, of, of their marriage and so uh, really had a sort of an established degree of, of independence and in that case although their incomes were somewhat similar the wife um, earned really quite substantial sums um, by way of bonuses and the the court's view you know as, as sort of already confirmed is that look you know it can't be 50-50 in, in every case. And, and that's um, relied upon as, as being a sort of a, a short marriage case. But, but really, I, I think it is um, very much a combination of factors, um, in particular, the fact that it is both relatively short um, and childless. Um, but, but the fact that they had dual careers and separate finances were, were undoubtedly um, really quite significant um, circumstantial reasons for um, departing from the, the, the much more typical 50-50 approach when dealing with marital assets. Um, and of, in the case below, FF and, and KF, um, this was a marriage of, of less than two years, um, but the court was clear that when assessing needs, it has an almost unbounded discretion. And so again, we're dealing with a, a marriage where very little of it could perhaps properly be coined as, as matrimonial, um, but, but needs will, will continue to, to be assessed and, and, and generously so in so far as, as it can be in, in that case. Um, this includes a capitalised lump sum for income needs calculated on the basis of a, of a 10 year term. Um, the court um, or the appeal court recognised that, that was perhaps more generous than some um, tribunals might determine, but um, but certainly not outside the, the realms of, of, of the, the broad and, and fact specific discretion that the courts have in, in assessing needs in these circumstances. And just very briefly, um, to um, comment on a, a few um, just financial remedies um, cases, uh, recent ones. This first one, Hassan and, and Al Hassan, is, is actually um, somewhat on topic um, because it is a claim where um, 
an unadjudicated claim for financial remedies um, was not continued because of the death of the respondent. Um, and so the the claim could not be, not be continued against against his estate. And, and in, in reaching this decision, um, the court considered itself that considered that it was bound by existing authority on the point, um, but formed the view that it was wrong um, in relatively um, for relatively compelling reasons. Um, essentially, that the, the short point being that um, a claim for post separation, post divorce financial provision um, should be recognised as a, as a cause of action. Um, if, if it is, um, it, it should continue um, against the estate. And um, the, the, I suppose this is perhaps more of a, a watch this space um, because um, the Moss and Jay considered that, that both he and the course of appeal were, were bound um, by the previous authority on the point, um, which he considered to, to be based on outdated notions of, of, of what a claim for financial remedies is. Um, and so granted a, a significant a certificate permitting a leapfrog appeal to the Supreme Court. So um, you know, we, we will see what the view of the Supreme Court is, but but um, it may well be that, that certain of these claims um, are now able to, to continue um, as financial remedies claims, um, which will of course have an impact on, on, on the claims made under the Inheritance Acts by other classes of, of individual under circumstances. Um, this is a um, Rathen and Kawad is 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 a useful case which um, I highlight um, because it, it is perhaps useful um, when looking at the proper approach to determining applications for maintenance pending suit. Um, not only does it provide a, a really quite helpful summary of the law, but it is dealing with um, a more common. Um, application for maintenance pending suit, um, one where the, the budget is fairly straightforward um, and, and therefore its analysis fairly typical. Um, these are the sorts of cases which are overwhelmingly more likely um, to be being dealt with by practitioners on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, too often um, cases which, which end up getting reported are of course extremely high value cases um, which which lawyers then have to do their best to apply to, 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 to rather more modest circumstances. But here, what the court's effectively saying is whilst the, the extensive and detailed analysis um, set out in previous decisions remains, of course, good law and entirely appropriate in, in the right cases, um, where budgets are straightforward, where um, the asserted needs of a party um, are typical, um, then the court is entitled to take a, a, a straightforward and, and, and simple analysis of that. And um, the court also made clear that in those circumstances, for example, a party is not even necessarily expected to um, submit a separate um, schedule of income needs beyond that, which was included within the original for me. Court's entitled to, to take a view on, on, on whether these, um, these needs are reasonable. Um, and of course, the other point in relation to, to MPS is that it's in respect of immediate needs. And the that was defined within the decision as being um, simply needs which are pending final resolution of the financial dispute. Um, and so cases um, where certain um, elements of expenditure were excluded for being perhaps not incurred on a monthly basis, or um, in this case, school fees, um, should not necessarily be, be excluded as not constituting um, immediate needs. So, so the hope is if, if this approach is, is, is sort of followed in, in MPS applications, the more typical MPS applications, um, the court's likely to deal with, and then hopefully it, it will result in a slightly more straightforward and simplified analysis um, when, when determining the applications themselves. Um, and then just, just finally, um, this is, this is an interesting case, um, because AZ and FM, because it's the, the first instance in which the court has determined that it has the jurisdiction um, on an application to um, vary or enforce um, a financial remedies order to capitalise obligations um, in respect of child maintenance. It, it's uh, that despite this being the sort of first case in which this has been identified as, as, as something which the court has jurisdiction to do, um, there weren't any sort of particular smoke and mirrors about it. Um, again, Moston just considered the, the language of, of the relevant statutory provision and, and formed the view that it was clear that, that um, Section 31.5 of the Matrimonial Causes Act permits capitalisation of, of child maintenance obligations. Um, and, and, and in fairness, 
what it does is it doesn't prohibit it. Um, and it seems as though the rationale for doing so is sound. But, but what the, the judge was clear to, um, to sort of emphasize is the, the jurisdiction to, to make these orders is, is, is perhaps distinct from the, um, <laughs> the frequency or the circumstances in which it, it will be so ordered. Um, the language he used was to say it would remain a, a very rare bird indeed. And um, in particular, the, the particular concerns are, of course, that, that um, you can't discontinue claims um, or any further rights to claim in respect of, of child maintenance. And the financial remedies courts are only able to exclude the jurisdiction of the child maintenance service for a period of up to 12 months. So it, it will always be um, and would only ever be something which is likely to be viewed as appropriate in extremely limited circumstances. Um, but it was in, in, in the present case. Um, the, the factors which were identified as, as being really quite relevant was that the husband was um, an incessant litigator, someone who thrived on, on litigation, and somebody who had indicated in the course of the hearing that he would be applying to, to vary again um, the, the, the order um, which was currently in place for, for child maintenance, which the, the wife had, had sought to enforce. Um, there was a history of repeated defaults and by him in making payments and the I, I say child but but of course that the individual um, for whom the, the payments were um, being received was 19 years old the, the order was to provide um, for the payment of maintenance until he um, concluded his tertiary education and, and so um, court was satisfied that the, the, the duration of any ongoing payments were, were certainly only going to be for a fairly limited period of time. Um, but it will be interesting to see the extent to which this this um, this is accepted as something which the court is, is able and prepared to do. Um, it, it, it seems likely in, in the first instance to be something which will be attempted um, by way of enforcement, because you would certainly suspect that there's going to be a need for um, a history of default um, before something like this is, is even likely to, to be contemplated. Um, and actually, I say in AZ, um, one of the the ways in which the court looked to go look to get around the fact that um, it couldn't preclude um, or disc discontinue um, any further applications in relation to child maintenance. Um, it did accept an undertaking on behalf of the wife, undertaking not to do so. Um, but it's certainly interesting um, and something which um, for the time being is, is only being considered in the context of an enforcement or variation application rather than um, substantive financial remedies proceedings. But um, we will see. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and, and um, grateful for your, um, your time and patience. Right, so I can see there are three questions in the chat box. The first one, Seems to be more of a question for me as the chancery person. Um, so to what degree do you feel costs of care of dependent children should be included in the surviving parent 1975 Act claim rather than the children by a litigation friend pursuing their own 1975 Act claims to a degree competing with their own surviving parent? Do conflicts of interest come into play? So the case that I mentioned at the start, re R, whilst there wasn't a claim by mother, the two children were represented by mother who was their litigation friend. I generally would take the view that if uh, you're concerned about the children um, and their care being provided for, they should be bringing their own claim. I wouldn't be inclined to include that within a surviving parent's claim. The standards are different, so the test is different. There's quite a clear conflict of interest. Um, but you'd need to have signed off. Um, I just wouldn't be inclined to do that because I think there's a very real risk of a judge turning around and saying, well, if they have their own claims, why have they not brought those claims? And why should I consider this as part of um, mother or father's claim? So I wouldn't be inclined to take that risk. The next question for Oliver. Is the length of the marriage determined by period up to separation or period up to decree? Um, a period up to separation. Um, so, so effectively, the, the, the sort of the rationale for including the premarital cohabitation um, was effectively that it would be unrealistic um, to, to, to do otherwise. And likewise, uh, the same is true of um, the period of time after separation, but, but before 
um, decree, it, effectively it would be artificial to, to include, or the view of the court is that it would be artificial to um, include that period in, in the duration of, of, of the marriage. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the right approach is the um, up to the period of separation um, itself. Okay, the next one also for Oliver, if you have a FRO and the respondent dies, is the cause of action an enforcement application against the estate or a claim under the 1975 Act? The if, if the respondents die, then um, yeah, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but it, it's a claim under the 1975 Act. Um, the sim, sim, fairly simply, the um, so certainly that that's that that's my understanding, and, and as I say, I'll, I'll be correct if if not. But the the sort of once the um, the respondent um, is deceased, and at that point, of course, um, the the order, um, or indeed, I suppose, the the entitlement to um, to sums under the order is something which would need to be pursued um, in respect of a claim under the, the 1975 Act, um, I believe. Um, as I said, I don't think Natasha can, can assist in any more uh, meaningful way, but that's my understanding. That's a lot, a lot of questions for you here. I'm just looking at the, the list. Um, next one is a pension fund is typically um, does not form part of a deceased estate. Where this happens, is it still a matrimonial asset for the purpose of the 1975 Act claim? The uh, when looking at um, the the sort of the calculation of um, matrimonial assets for the purposes of a, of a 1975 Act claim, um, what generally that you're going to want to do is, is sort of look to apply the, the sort of the principles as best you can, recognising that the, the actual asset pot itself um, may well be, be different as a, as a consequence. The, the other, um, I, I suppose, distinction between um, a, an assessment in the ordinary course of events and an assessment for the purposes of a 1975 Act claim is there may well be life insurance policies which have um, been redeemed, um, which of course increase the the assets which are available. Um, and the other point to make, I suppose, um, is that the the assessment it doesn't require the, sort of the, the sort of quasi and financial remedies, really meticulous approach. And so I suspect um, that, that really what you're looking at here is is, is more of a um, a broad brush understanding of, of how it might be dealt with, and, and the, the significance of, of 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 course a pension fund is its income. Um, needs being being met in in, in retirement, and um, all of course going to be able to do is, is work with with what's actually available, um, and so it, to a certain extent it, it would feed into the uh, the calculation of how income needs are going to be met and 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 for how long they they need to be met because of course if, if the asset's no longer available it's not going to to, to meet needs, um, but. It is something, you know, when, when forming the assessment um, for the purposes of the 1975 Act, um, you have to be alive to what is what is actually available. And sometimes it's slightly more because of, of life insurance policies and the like, and sometimes by virtue of um, the deceased death, it, it, it's slightly less. And, and, and so you can still, I think, apply the same principles, just recognising that the actual pot it is perhaps slightly different as a consequence of the circumstances. And then last question, can a wife who is about to divorce claim any interest on an expectant bequest of a substantial legacy to a parent who is still alive? No will is made at present. Would that fall outside the division of the split? Um, it, it is a matter of, of fact and degree, really. Um, it, it's a, one of the things which the, the court's required to consider um, is income and resources which the party are likely to have in, in the foreseeable future. Um, and this is arguably, well, it's not arguably, I mean, this is a, a, a resource which the party is, is likely to have in the foreseeable future. Um, well, the, the question is, is, is what constitutes foreseeable? Um, and I suppose in the context of that question, it depends on, on how soon um, the, the, the legacy is, is, is expected to be received. Um, and I, I think to a certain extent as well, um, to what extent the the wife can properly be um, said to have needs which um, could be met by that legacy. Um, relevant fact, this is something which, which again is perhaps um, 
the length of the marriage itself may well be a, a relevant factor um, because the, the longer the marriage, um, the more that the inheritance prospects of either party are likely to be, to be known to the other. And, and the more you could realistically argue that it was something that you had a um, needs which, which, which were anticipated to be met out of that, um, that legacy. But um, if you are dealing with um, a, a div divorcing parties who one party has inheritance prospects which are significant, but their parents are in, in good health and um, no, no reason to assume that, that their um, demise is imminent, for, for lack of a better phrase, um, then it is very likely certainly in the ordinary course of events as, as to be viewed as too unforeseeable um, as to be brought into the um, the consideration of, of, of assets which are available to meet the party's needs. That's another question. Uh, does approaching a claim under the IHA using FR principles make it more likely that a judge will adopt Duxbury calculations rather than Ogden tables when approaching calculation of a capital sum? Um, well, certainly, um, whether it's because um, you're approaching the claim using financial remedies principles or not, I would certainly suggest that yes, luxury calculations are the way in which um, capitalization will take place. Um, and it's, it, I suppose it's again just a recognition of the reality of, of, of what's likely to, to sort of be available um, for distribution. But no, certainly. Um, it, it's it's my experience and understanding that the Duxbury calculations are going to be the the sort of ordinarily the way in which um, the, these calculations are adopted for the purposes of, of capitalising um, income needs or future income needs for the purposes of, of an inheritance tax claim. Just on that point, um, I tend to use Duxbury. There was a point made in. Um, the case, I think it was the B and C and others case. It was quite a complicated case, one of the cases I referred to on the slides. And the point was made there that the barristers had all agreed that essentially it's going to be dealt with by Duxbury. So there can be a bit of a debate over how exactly you would deal with it. But you'll tend to find that council will come to some sort of agreement as to what they feel is the appropriate method of doing so, uh, to save the judge having to deal with the arguments about that as well. Um, one of the other things that I would just flag to everyone, those of you that deal with probably high value estates are, will already be aware, but what tends to happen when you instruct uh, someone uh, with a chancery background for your 1975 Act opinion, if you've got a particularly high value estate or it's a situation where the assets um, that would be part of the matrimonial pots or would have been part of the matrimonial pots are particularly complicated or it's not quite clear exactly whether certain assets would form part of that pot because they may have been several marriages and so on, you will tend to find that person will suggest to you that insofar as the deemed divorce test is concerned, that you obtain an opinion from a family practitioner who can deal with the matrimonial finance aspect of that. And then your chancery practitioner will consider that alongside the other criteria in section three. So that's the, the main reason why we thought this would be helpful to have this as a joint webinar, because you do have that strange situation of overlap where there will be nuances that only a family practitioner would know. Um, hopefully that's been helpful for all of you. I don't think there are any more questions. Um, don't forget to fill in the, uh, the feedback survey and there's an option on there for you to set out whether there are any particular topics that you'd like us to talk about in future. It's really helpful if you can give us some ideas, that's great. Uh, but otherwise, um, enjoy the rest of your days.